Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ted Hagelin, the director of the New York State Science and Technology Law Center at Syracuse University College of Law. And welcome to the second in our spring series of webcasts uh, on technology commercialization. Uh, our speaker today is George McGuire. Uh, George is a graduate of Syracuse University's College of Engineering with a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering and a graduate of Syracuse University College of Law uh, uh, with a JD and magna cum laude. George is also uh, a, an illustrious uh, alum of our uh, technology commercialization program uh, here at Syracuse Law School. Uh, George is the president of the New York um, Central New York Patent Law Association, actively involved in work with the American Intellectual Property Law Association, the New York State Bar Association Intellectual Property Section, and the International Trademark Law Association. Uh, George is the chair of Bon Schenick and King's Intellectual Property Practice Group, uh, and in that capacity provides day-to-day -day counseling on a broad range of legal issues raised to the development and use of new technologies, including software, uh, intellectual property license, uh, right to use, uh, trade secret, trademark, and patent procurement uh, before the U.S. PTO. Uh, George also is an adjunct professor in the Syracuse University Law School and teaches, of course, in computer law, uh, which is one of his areas of deep expertise. And he's just been telling me that he's involved in multiple litigations around the country. And so uh, I don't know when he finds time to sleep, uh, but we're delighted to have with us today George McGuire. George? Thank you, Ted. And thank all of you out there in cyberspace that are listening in today and, and uh, looking at the slides. It's my understanding that you have copies of the slides uh, that you can run and um, your video presentation. Say something about email question. Yeah. And um, you can see me on the camera as well as the screen behind me, although you will have uh, a lot of difficulty making out the content of the of the slides, relying on that. So hopefully you have copies of the slides, and as I go through, I'll reference the slide number that I'm uh, working on. Now, if any of you have questions during the course of the presentation, my understanding is the process is you can email those to the uh, New York uh, Science and Technology Law Center email address uh, and the questions will be handed up to me. Uh, I'll, I will either answer them in the context of the portion of the presentation we're at, if that's when they come in, uh, or we will save all of the questions for the end of the presentation and we'll go through them one by one at that point in time. But, but do feel free to email any questions uh, as we go along to the, uh, to the New York State Technology and Law Center email address that you all have. Now, the uh, seminar today, or the, the lecture that I was giving today, is, is a, a derivative of one that I, I delivered about three or four weeks ago to a, a very large group of patent attorneys, and uh, it's therefore a, a little bit more uh, focused on, on the law and the legal updates, and based on the, uh, the attendees at today's conference, we have a, a good group of, of patent attorneys and, and other lawyers out there, but we also have a lot of business folks and university folks uh, listening in as well. And for that reason, I will try to adjust uh, the, the, the slide show a little bit in, in terms of the way I describe things. Uh, but do uh, feel free to ask me any questions that, that may be specific to your particular uh, business, whether it's in the educational research community or whether it's in uh, business, or obviously the lawyers can, can always ask questions uh, with respect to uh, what it is they're interested in. Now, the patent law update uh, that uh, I put together for this particular presentation is really a review of the case law that's been coming out of the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and to some degree the Supreme Court over the last uh, year, year and a half or so, and looking for trends that are, that are starting to migrate the patent laws uh, in a way that, that's different from the ways the, the laws were being interpreted prior to say, a year and a half, two years ago. And there are a few significant trends that have been emerging uh, by analyzing all of the, the precedent that's been coming out of the courts. Uh, this, this first slide is slide number two, the, the first slide being the, the cover page, for those of you that, that have the slideshow, uh, either on a, a different computer screen or in paper form. Uh, this slide kind of 
shows the, the symbolism of, of where I see the status of, of patent law right now. And as you can see, there's a, there's a lobster there, and, and in one claw, uh, it says 112 slash 101. And what that's in reference to is section 112 of the Patent Act and section 101 of the Patent Act, section 112 uh, containing a provision regarding the requirement for a written description of the invention uh, in the patent application. The law on 112 paragraph 1, or the written description requirement, has been taking some pretty significant turns uh, that are not favorable to the patentee. Section 101 is the subject matter provision of the Patent Act. What kind of subject matter is, is appropriate for uh, patents to be granted with respect to uh, it, too, has been taking some, some slices out of the, the sphere or the universe of patentable subject matter. So we'll talk a little bit about the Section 101 precedent that's been coming down. And then in that other pincher of the lobster, I have 103, which is the obviousness statute. So for those of you familiar with the, the patent laws, all inventions have to be non-obvious over the prior art to be uh, awarded a patent. And the law of obviousness uh, has changed uh, somewhat become a little bit more subjective and open-ended than it was prior to a, a fairly significant case that was handed down uh, within the last year and a half at the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Um, so we will go through uh, Section 103. And then on the side, you can see there, there's a few patents that have made their way around the lobster that have kind of escaped the, the grasp of the pictures. But the message at the end of the day is uh, it's very tough out there right now in terms of uh, applying for prosecuting and receiving uh, patent protection of the same type uh, that was once available uh, before some of this precedent started to get handed down. Now I'm on slide number three, which talks about the trends and hot topics. Uh, what I'll talk about today, the impact of KSR. KSR was the name of one of the parties in the obviousness case that, that kind of uh, has created lots of issues with regard to the protection of inventions and overcoming the Section 103 requirement. Uh, generally speaking, and we'll go through this in more detail, uh, where obviousness has been at issue since the time of KSR, the patentee has not fared well. So where uh, obviousness has been an issue that's been litigated in the context of a patent infringement lawsuit for those cases that have been fully litigated, uh, patentees have not have not fared well. The, the, the challenge for obviousness has been very, very successful since the time of KSR. Um, and looking at the cases at the CAFC uh, through March of this year, there's been approximately uh, 17 cases where obviousness was the issue. There's only been two where patentability has been confirmed on the grounds of obviousness. So uh, a vast majority of the ones where obviousness is at issue are, are finding the patents to be invalid. Uh, with that, there's a trend coming out of the CAFC with this predictable arts versus this uh, unpredictable arts. And I, and I will talk a little bit more about that in a little while. Uh, and then there's this concept of, of long felt need which was always a very strong uh, secondary consideration of non-obviousness, kind of taking a back seat now. And this idea of identifying problems and uh, determining whether there's only a finite set of potential solutions for it, uh, kind of getting a new life uh, since KSR. And I, I will talk a little bit about uh, one uh, decision in particular. Uh, do you have any comments about design patents, especially in view of the recent Egyptian goddess decision? Um, yeah, we, we could talk a little bit about design patents. I, I didn't specifically put that in here, as uh, although it, the Egyptian goddess case did uh, bring in some significant, not necessarily terribly new, but, but a little bit new standards for determining design patents. Uh, and, I, and I do think uh, design patentees will fare better under the new standard of Egyptian goddess than they did uh, under the old tests, the ordinary observer tests. Um, but uh, I, I don't have any specific comments other than uh, I, I think the, the new standard will make it a little bit more uniform, make the analysis a, a little bit more streamlined, and I do think at the end of the day uh, the design patentees will, will actually fare a little bit better, but, but design patents have never been a really heavily litigated 
uh, type of issue. So you don't see a ton of cases coming down on that. Egyptian Goddess was, uh, was kind of the, the first milestone case in a long, long time in the design patent case. Um, I will mention that I've written a paper on Egyptian Goddess that will be posted uh, soon, and I will make sure I send a copy up to Molly uh, as soon as the, uh, the, the editing is done on the paper, and then Molly can, can distribute it um, to those that subscribe to the, uh, to the Science and Technology Law Center um, uh, email list. We do send, I know the Science and Technology Law Center sends out copies of articles, so I will make it available for uh, the Science and Technology Law Center to publish uh, on its website, and uh, that should be done probably within the next few weeks. So I'll send it up to Molly, and then if Molly sees fit to, to posting it, it, it'll be posted here for you. And I'll make sure uh, I make a note of doing that. And that'll explain a little bit more about the Egyptian goddess uh, precedent and how it's actually uh, being treated. Um, okay, n the next area uh, after obviousness is this, uh, this decision uh, of Seagate. Seagate was a case that that changed the standard or that changed the analysis for determining willfulness violations. Uh, a lot of people thought after Seagate came out there would be a significant impact on securing opinions of counsel when you learn of a, a potentially troublesome patent or are accused of infringement. And at the end of the day, looking at the decisions that have been handed down on willfulness since the time of Seagate, uh, they've been decided very, very similarly to the way they would have been decided under the uh, Morrison Knudsen precedent, which was the precedent prior to uh, uh, Seagate, but we'll go through some of those things. But it really, I put non-impact of Seagate on opinions, and I put non in parentheses there because Seagate really has not had a significant effect on the way uh, uh, those that are, that are uh, challenged by a patentee have been proceeding. The new section 112 paragraph 1 with new in parentheses, this is the harder line stance on the written description requirement that I mentioned, and uh, I will go through some of the, uh, the new challenges under section 112 paragraph 1. Uh, finally, or not finally, but, but uh, also the Bilski case, which was the kind of the precedent setting case for subject matter, it's changing the, the statutory requirements for a process to be considered patentable subject matter uh, in a way that is going to make it more difficult for certain types of uh, invention to be considered proper subject matter for patents. So uh, we'll go through some of the Section 101 cases and the confusion that this uh, Bilski decision has created. And then last but not least are these licensing cases, the, the Quanta case that the Supreme Court decided uh, nearly a year ago now, probably about eight months ago now, and then there's been a couple of follow-on cases uh, that dealt with licensing agreements and the patent exhaustion doctrine and how you deal with, uh, with potential uh, exhaustion issues when your technology is such that it has value at various points in the distribution chain of a particular technology. So um, if you have a manufacturing process for a microchip or you have an actual microchip, the manufacturer takes some value from it, the consumer product company that buys the chips that puts it into their products uh, derives a benefit from it and then the end user derives a benefit from it and how many bites of the apple do you get in terms of, of generating royalty revenue. So there's been a couple of, of decisions that have been handed down since Quanta uh, was decided with the Supreme Court last year. Okay, the next slide, which is slide four, uh, talking about KSR and this, what they call a flexible approach to section 103 or the obviousness stat statute. And um, there's a couple of sound bites that I grab out of the case that have been uh, particularly uh, used by the patent office in making 103 rejections and have certainly been cited in, in further district court and CAFC opinions when holding patent claims invalid under Section 103 in light of the KSR. When there is a design need or market pressure to solve a problem and a finite number of identified predictable solutions, and this is where the finite number, we're talking about um, uh, the, the idea of problem identification, having some life back into it, uh, that's where the finite number of identified and then predictable uh, solutions, and this is that predictable versus unpredictable paradigm that I, that I pointed out in the prior slide came from. 
a person of ordinary skill has good reason to pursue the known options within his or her technical, technical grasp, and if this leads to the anticipated success, it's likely the product not of innovation, but of ordinary skill and common sense. So a lot of the opinions, like I said before, have been getting broken down along these lines of a predictable art versus an unpredictable art, and also looking at uh, when there's problem identification, uh, making a showing that there's no finite number of potential solutions, but really an infinite number of potential solutions, or a very, very high number of potential solutions, and you just don't know which one is going to work best. So where those things have been shown, um, you stand a much better chance of, of overcoming the obviousness hurdle, as I'll, I'll, I'll talk about here momentarily. Now, in determining whether the subject matter of a patent claim is obvious, neither the particular motivation nor the avowed purpose of the patentee controls. What matters is the objective reach of the claim, and if the claim extends to what is obvious, it's invalid under Section 103. Now, this is uh, going back to language that, that used to be seen a lot when making what they called hindsight rejections of inventions. In other words, you see the solution, you say, anyone could have thought of that. I don't care that the uh, inventor might have been motivated by profit or the lack of a, of, of, a, of a product available in the market. That motivation doesn't matter anymore. Now that I see that solution, yeah, it's plainly obvious or it was common sense to me why they come up with it. So hindsight rejections are becoming more and more troublesome to have to deal with. Uh, prior to KSR, where they had a little bit more rigid uh, analysis uh, of obviousness, and there, there had to be an, an actual showing of some teaching suggestion or motivation in the prior art to actually come up with the claimed invention. Uh, now they're saying, well, that motivation in the prior art could have been uh, simply common sense, and that's why you're not seeing any express uh, recitation of the, of the particular motivation or the particular teaching. So one of the ways in which a patent subject matter can be proved obvious is by noting that there existed at the time of invention a known product for which there were was an obvious solution encompassed by the patent's claims. So again, uh, this, this idea of common sense from the prior bullet point and the idea of a finite number of solutions to a problem uh, has again uh, made it a little bit more subjective, even though the, 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 the line here says objective reach of a claim, the analysis has become a, a, a bit more subjective in the eye of the patent examiner or in the eye of a jury or the eye of a, a judge that, that's hearing the, uh, the issues on obviousness. Now the next slide kind of shows this breakdown between the predictable and unpredictable parts. Um, just taking a couple of recent cases as examples of where the courts are coming down on this. And I, I put in there, and again, this was, was geared more towards lawyer, but it, is sweat of the brow the operative obviousness test now? Now, sweat of the brow is a term that comes from the copyright law, for those familiar with uh, the Feist copyright decision with trying to, to, to get a copyright on a telephone book listing. Uh, and it takes a lot of work, but there's not a lot of creativity that goes into it. And the court's coming down and saying, well, that doesn't make it copyrightable. The fact that you had to put a lot of effort into it uh, doesn't make it copyrightable in and of itself. It has to have some original uh, thought and alliter original expression and, and origin arranging names uh, without any selection, coordination, or, or unique arrangement of those names in a phone book isn't going to, to buy you a copyright, even though it took a lot of effort to put it together. But now, with the patent laws, and KSR coming down, the courts are starting to talk about this predictable versus unpredictable art. Now I put side by side one case in which the court knocked down the patent as being obvious, uh, and the, the tenor of the opinion saying, well, this is a very predictable art, and therefore it's going to be an obviousness type problem. And then another case where the, the court uh, focused in on how unpredictable uh, the art is, and therefore the fact that the solution was derived uh, makes it non-obvious, even though you would know by combining the particular compounds in the way, you might get this result, but because it was a lot of trial and error involved in order to get the, just the right mix, that was what uh, overcame the, the obviousness hurdle in the eyes of the justices. Now, Line Rothman versus Target. This uh, is, a, is a useful case to, to exemplify this predictable arts test because it, it did deal with a very simple product. This was a, uh, a shirt, a nursing shirt for, for 
uh, women who were nursing that had uh, kind of a nursing bra built into the shirt itself. So it combined a traditional tank top type document uh, article of manufacture with a traditional nursing bra type article of manufacture, stitched them together in a, in a certain way such that the article uh, provided this functionality. And the, the court in this case, this is a quote, to the contrary, this invention falls into a very predictable field. In the predictable arts, a trial record may more readily show a motivation to combine known elements to yield a predictable result, thus rendering a claimed invention obvious. Nursing garment design is a predictable art. Okay. So it's going to become very, very, very difficult for clothing manufacturers now, uh, in light of a, a precedent like this, to take functionality that's existed in clothing articles, combine them in new ways, create new structures for the clothing, and then be able to protect them with patents. It's a, it's a very harmful statement to that particular industry uh, that once relied very, very heavily on the patent laws to, to gain competitive advantage. Now, as Ms. Ms. Rothman acknowledged in her testimony, a shoulder strap is a shoulder strap. And it's not surprising that just one day into night, she was able to combine an off-the-shelf jockey tank top with a built-in shelf bra and an off-the-shelf Olga nursing bra to arrive at the claimed invention. So kind of discounting or um, belittling the inventive aspects of what this inventor went through, because it only took her one day to do it, all of a sudden, it's too simplistic to be deservant uh, of a patent in the eyes of the court when all of the elements were individually known even though they had never been combined in the same manner before. Now we compare that with this unpredictable arts on the, on the right hand column of the slide, uh, which is a biotech case. Now all of the unpredictable art cases that have been handed down since the time of KSR have been in the biochemistry or molecular biology uh, field. Anything other than uh, molecular biology and biochemistry had, had fallen into the predictable arts with, with one minor exception, which I will get to in the next slide. Now this dealt with whether or not it was obvious to try separating the anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-an
you know, the differences between bouncing off of walls and tables is no different from the problem of bouncing off of the exterior of buildings and cars and things that might be moving. The, the, the elements of the technology are all there, even though there might have to be a, a little bit of uh, jiggering around of the, of, of the algorithms to make it work in an indoor environment, so they found it obvious. The uh, CAFC, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, reversed, saying this is a question of fact. And in this particular case, we had two expert opinions, one on each side, that gave uh, diametrically opposed testimony. Uh, both sets of experts were found to be credible. And because of the fact that, that the uh, Court of Appeals determined the, uh, the testimony of the experts to be credible and uh, one favoring obviousness, the other one favoring non-obviousness, they said this can't be resolved on summary judgment. Send it back down to the trial court for a trial on that particular issue. So they, they, they didn't uh, come right out and say, well, this is so predictable in wireless local area network technology that uh, it, it, is, it is absolutely obvious, and nor did they come out and say, this is so unpredictable that it could never be obvious. Uh, I call this a borderline case, where they, they said you really just got to go to a jury, see who the jury believes on the uh, credibility of these experts. Now, this is kind of uh, my academic side coming out a little bit on this next slide, slide number seven. Problems with using predictable versus unpredictable arts as the obviousness test. I found this little piece of clip art on the internet of a Shakespearean monkey. Uh, if the art is truly unpredictable, and we're talking about lots of effort to come up with the right combination of elements, isn't that uh, really a matter of putting so many monkeys at so many typewriters and waiting for Hamlet to emerge. It doesn't make it necessarily any more inventive than someone who kind of knows where they're going with their research, with their development, and comes out with a product without expending significant uh, time or, or failed research results. Um, so drawing that line between predictable and unpredictable arts in terms of an invention uh, in my mind, doesn't necessarily capture what the patent laws were intended to protect, and that is new and non-obvious and useful products. Now, if the art is predictable, and this is going the other way, it's cutting the other way, if the art is predictable, like uh, garment design, for instance, based on that other case, if the art is predictable and there is no anticipatory art, in other words, the exact same thing cannot have been shown to exist in a publication or in a prior use, uh, isn't that a strong indicator of its non-obviousness? In other words, if it's so obvious, why hasn't someone come up with it before? Why do they have to rely on obviousness as opposed to anticipation as the grounds for denying patent coverage? And they never really address that. Now. Uh, again, when you're dealing with prosecution of, of applications in the predictable arts, uh, it's useful to always bear in mind the idea that you may have to rely very heavily on secondary considerations to support your prosecution record in ultimately securing some patent rights on this technology in a predictable field. In other words, keep in, the, in mind the, the long felt need, keep in mind the commercial success, keep in mind the advertising of the technology and make sure it draws a nexus towards whatever the inventive point is in the technology and, and, and put that into your file so that if ever needed, you can bring that out and create a, a strong record of non-obviousness. Now, the other aspect is if you're thinking about the patent system as is, is being there to provide an incentive for, for folks to create, again, most of the non uh, unpredictable arts, or the, the, the non-obvious arts that have been coming down since, since KSR, have been in these really basic research fields, the molecular bio fields, for instance, where, where you're getting a lot of basic research done. And a lot of that research, from an incentive standpoint, is going to happen regardless of whether there's a patent system or not. Uh, you know, the commercial partners, obviously, will want the patent system, but the basic research itself it is going to, to, to occur so long as the government continues to fund uh, the basic research, which under the last administration they stopped doing. Under the new administration, they seem to be uh, pouring more dollars into, into the basic research, at least with stem cells and, and uh, hopefully some other areas as well. And we'll see more NIH grants and more uh, uh, grants coming out of government agencies for some good basic research. But again, from an incentive standpoint, there's there's not necessarily the, the same incentive. If you want new products, you generally do have to provide some incentive to, to create those. So the incentive argument cuts both ways, but 
uh, basing your obviousness on predictable versus unpredictable is very, very difficult. Long felt need versus problem recognition. Again, this is uh, cutting both ways. There's a case, AgriZap versus Woodstream, where there was lots of evidence of secondary considerations um, with regard to a rat killing uh, mechanism that used the conductivity of the rat as an element to complete a circuit and, and uh, basically zap the rat to death. Um, where the, the, the court just ignored all of the secondary considerations saying, well, obviously there's conductivity in the body, there's lots of fluid, the, the electricity is going to go there and they bridge the circuit, they're going to get killed. Yeah, okay. So it's all uh, good and well, the fact that the structure wasn't taught before, wasn't of much moment, the fact that the product was hugely commercially successful was not of much moment. Um, and then you, 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 know, you take that and you, you kind of sigh a little bit. Um, Kim Moore, uh, the newest of the CAFC judges, uh, wrote this a particular opinion, and you're going to see a trend with, with Kim because she's one of the more vocal advocates on the court, very, very smart, a uh, good judge, but she's very anti-patent so far in her, in her rulemaking. And the one pet judge on the opposite side of the coin, Judge Newman, is probably going to be leaving the court during this, uh, because of her age, uh, during this, this next administration. So we're, we're hopeful that um, to the extent that uh, new judges get appointed during this administration that they look for uh, candidates that are strong patent proponents. Because right now, uh, the last administration put on a lot of anti-patent proponents onto the CAFC. Now, recognition of the problem is, is what I alluded to earlier. Judge Rader, who is a pro-patent uh, judge, probably the last one after Judge Newman uh, leaves the court, um, in a dissent in a biotech case, the Chapman case, uh, did hold that where there are, is evidence that there's not a finite number of solutions to a technical problem, that is going to be strong evidence of non-obviousness. So if you're thinking about when you're drafting a patent application or you're applying for a patent on your invention or you're prosecuting the application or you're litigating uh, a patent and obviousness is at issue, uh, certainly bearing in mind the dissent from, from this particular Chapman case and seeing what Judge Rader was pointing to uh, would, be, would be wise to take into consideration. And um, you really have to, to choose between that long felt but unmet need versus this recognition of the problem because of the way the cases have been coming down and choose which one, uh, uh, the, hopefully the court will, will become clear in which one it wants to go, but they're really uh, inconsistent with one another. But again, it, it also boils down to which panel of judges you get at the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit uh, as to how these cases are, are being dealt with. Now, moving on to willfulness, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on willfulness because uh, I, I raise it only because people thought it was going to have a huge shift, and it just, it just hasn't come to fruition. Before the Seagate opinion, uh, the standard for determining whether one is willfully infringing a patent was, did the uh, accused infringer exercise his affirmative duty to determine whether uh, he or she or it was infringing, including among other things, getting a, uh, an, a competent opinion of counsel. And this came out of the 1983 Fed Circuit case of, of underwater devices versus Morrison Knudsen. Seagate changed that language a little bit, saying a finding of willfulness requires an accused infringer uh, to have acted despite an objectively high likelihood that its actions constituted infringement and the objectively defined risk was known or should have been known by the accused infringer. Now, it, it's made proof of willfulness a little bit more difficult, but at the end of the day, in looking at the cases, it, it, it seems to be very, very uh, consistent in the way the cases would be handed down. Uh, Reed versus Portek was, was kind of the, the keystone case that laid out all of the factors for determining whether one is willfully infringing a patent. And just like in the, the pre-Seagate cases, the post-Seagate cases still have been pointing to those exact same uh, Reed versus Portek factors. So the factors that are going into the calculus for a willfulness determination uh, have not changed. Um, the standard objective recklessness seems to be a higher standard, but at the end of the day, when you apply the Reed versus Portek factors, uh, if you found willfulness under uh, pre-Seagate cases, you'll also find it under the objective, will, uh, objectively uh, uh, reckless behavior standard of Seagate. And I'll run through a couple of uh, uh, just statistics. 
Um, since Seagate, there's been five cases where no opinion has been rendered. In three of those cases, they've still found no willfulness, and in two of those cases, uh, willfulness was found. And if you look at those five opinions, the three uh, where there was no willfulness, it was just a very weak infringement claim, or the pl plaintiff at, uh, waited years and years uh, before bringing the case, and the same kind of factors would have cut against the willfulness finding pre-Seagate. The two willfulness cases were, again, intentional copying, uh, not doing anything to uh, check on the, the infringement, and again, pre-Seagate, -Se pre willful would have been found, most likely post-Seagate it was also found. Eight cases where opinions were rendered by counsel, no willfulness was found, uh, same would have applied pre-Seagate. Three cases post-Seagate where opinions of counsel were rendered and the court still found willfulness, but the reasons for having found willfulness would have cut against the accused infringer pre-Seagate just as well. Uh, they, they typically involved an incompetent opinion of counsel where you didn't either, either didn't have a patent attorney drafting the opinion who didn't understand the patent laws, or they only state their opinions in very conclusory terms and do not do a thorough analysis of the infringement. And again, the competency of the the opinion is still key, just like it was pre-Seagate. Now on that next slide, where there was no opinion but no willfulness, like I said before, the same kinds of factors from Reed v. Portek uh, found against willfulness post-Seagate just like they would have pre-Seagate. There was evidence of design around efforts, there was strong non-infringement, there was delay, uh, and there was still some sort of technical infringement analyses uh, that might have been rendered by, by uh, either engineers or by in-house counsel who may not have been patent attorneys, but they were given some credibility. But there is this Funai versus Diving case, which was just handed down, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, where there was an opinion. Um, uh, but for other reasons, it was not accepted. Now, on the next slide, no opinion, uh, but no, uh, but willful. Word Tech Systems versus Integrated Network Solutions, very recent case. For the lawyers out there, I've given the Lexus site to it because it's too new to have a court reporter site. Um, it was a few weeks ago. The defendant's products were shown to be carbon copies of the plaintiff's designs. The defendants were repeatedly notified that their products infringed, and they made no effort to determine whether the patents were invalid or not infringed. And they continued to engage in their conduct for, for many, many years. So again, it was a, a case that was found willful, and it would have been found willful pre-Seagate most likely also. Opinion, but willful is this Funai case, another very, very recent case, so I've given a Lexus site to it if you're interested in pulling it up. Uh, Daiwu had its own employees, uh, Song and Kang, investigate whether Daiwu was infringing. And these were engineers in Korea that were doing this investigation. Uh, they didn't know the standards for U.S. patent law. They didn't uh, apply the, uh, you know, the Markman standards for claim construction and element by element analysis. Um, Subsequently, Dai did get an opinion at counsel, but it used a South Korean law firm that admittedly had no training in U.S. law. So again, the opinion was not uh, done appropriately. So if they had secured U.S. counsel's opinion, it probably would have come out the other way if, in fact, uh, the opinion was favorable to the accused infringer. So again, probably no difference pre-Seagate versus post-Seagate. Okay. Um, trying to get through all these slides in the time we have, I wanted to move on now to the written description requirement because this is an area of law uh, that is changing very, very rapidly. It's not favorable to the patentee and uh, it, it affects both non-biotech cases and biotech cases. The biotech cases are actually affected in a, in a slightly different way than the non-biotech cases and that's why I, I kind of segregated the two out. Now there was a 2005 case that was uh, not heavily uh, analyzed when it first came out. It was a case called Lizard Tech and it dealt with the distribution of, of telecom calling cards out of a kiosk um, that was decided on a written description where the claims were held invalid for lacking a written description of the invention. and. It was an interesting case uh, because the Fed Circuit is split on the issue of whether a written description requirement can invalidate originally filed claims. Now, when you file a patent application, as those of you who have filed patent applications are aware, the patent app application has to conclude with one or more claims. 
traditionally those claims are considered to be part of the original specification. So if you say my invention comprises elements A, B, and C, an apparatus comprising elements A, B, and C, you would think that's a pretty good statement of what the inventor considered his or her invention to be. They claimed it, after all, right in the outset of the original filing, which makes it part of the original specification. Now, in, in, in lizard tech, the original claims were the ones that were declared invalid for having lacked a written description because they did not uh, contain an element of a monitor or a display that was remote from the kiosk. In, in the original uh, specification and in the preferred embodiment, this was just a stand-up unit, a kiosk unit, uh, where someone could go and, and generate a, a calling card. But the claims were broader than that. They weren't limited specifically to a kiosk, but could have been uh, infringed upon by the use of a remote laptop computer that accessed a server somewhere, which then generated the calling card on the person's printer or, or other media device uh, that was being used. Uh, so the, the claims were, were much broader than this idea of just having a kiosk that you could walk up to and hit the claims uh, keys to generate your calling card. But they, they rejected it. They, they said these claims are not valid because the written description is not broad enough to encompass claims of that particular scope. And the question I had in this case was if they were in the originally filed claims, and the originally filed claims are considered part of the specification, uh, then is it so much a written description requirement or is it a lack of enablement requirement? Now, lack of enablement is also found in Section 112 of the Patent Act, but it's an independent and distinct requirement for patentability versus the written description requirement. The enablement requirement is you must disclose the details of your invention uh, in, in such a way that you enable someone of skill in the art to practice the invention without having to exercise undue experimentation. So it deals with a level of disclosure as opposed to uh, whether or not the invention itself is actually described uh, in the patent application. So here we have original claims rejected because they said the specification was not broad enough to encompass them. And so this particular panel of, of the CAFC was taking the position uh, originally filed claims really don't form part of the original specification. Um, now, practice pointers, there's lots of ways to, to make sure you're getting the full breadth of your claims in your specification in the manner in which you write your patent application, but uh, I won't go into details on, on that. The original uh, Lizard Tech case was a three-judge panel that held this way. They requested that an end back hearing be, be held on because of this particular uh, split of authority. And the really interesting opinion for the lawyers out there to read is not the original Lizard Tech opinion, but it's the decision that denied hearing the case and back. And for those non-lawyers out there, and back means all of the judges that sit at the Court of Appeals would hear the case and render an opinion on it. Uh, all, most cases are decided with three judge panels, so only three of the judges on the, on the Court of Appeals would hear any particular case. Every year there's probably four or five cases uh, that are heard in back, and those are obviously very significant decisions. Now, uh, they denied and back, and Judge Rader again wrote a very, very good dissent as to saying why they should have heard this case and back, and he points out that very dichotomy that I just described uh, with regard to the written description requirement uh, and the claim that's originally filed. Now, more recently, the reason I brought up Lizard Tech because it was used as the basis of two opinions, one in 08 and one here earlier in 09, Power Oasis and, and ICU. Now, again, interesting thing on Power Oasis and ICU, both opinions authored by, by Judge Moore, uh, not necessarily a pro-patent judge, the way her decisions are coming out, and you can, can really see it shining through with these two particular opinions, Power Oasis. Uh, the applicant created a written description issue by um, using a very, very questionable tactic with regard to the manner in which the patent application was being prosecuted. They filed a continuation in part application instead of a continuation application or a request for continued examination, uh, which means that there's a presumption that you've added something new to your disclosure. And the court in that uh, Power Oasis case said that the subject matter of the claims was not supported in the original application and was part of that new matter that was added in the CIP. Obviously, the applicant or the patentee was arguing that there was support for the claims in the originally filed specification. 
and therefore they should have been entitled to that priority date because what happened was there was intervening prior art, prior art that came to be between the original filing date and the CIP filing date, so that prior art, which would not have been effective against the original application, was effective against the CIP, and as a result, the patent, he lost the patent uh, for lack of written description. And again, if the patentee really thought there was support in the original specification, filing it by way of a CIP instead of a continuation or instead of a uh, request for continued examination, uh, in, in hindsight, is certainly a very questionable prosecution tactic and probably not one that, that should have been, been taken on. Now, ICU was another case uh, just decided about two months ago. Um, Again, Kim Moore wrote the opinion in this one. And this involved a, a medical device, namely a valve that had a, a piercing element associated with it so that the, the piercing element would pierce the uh, saline or the medication or whatever it was that was going to be delivered to the patient, and the valve would open and, and allow the, the fluid to flow appropriately. And they had a claim that did not require a piercing member. And because all of the embodiments disclosed in the patent application all contained a piercing element and the claim did not contain a piercing element and the infringer obviously did not have a piercing element. The court decided this case that the claimed invention, this valve without the piercing element, uh, lacked a written description. And these were claims that were added after the original filed application and therefore the same argument that they were in there from the get-go and therefore constituted part of the original written description didn't exist, uh, which made it much more difficult for the patentee in this particular case. Um, again, uh, Kim um, did not have a lot of problems finding a, a lack of written description in this case. And, and, and like I said, Kim's becoming uh, a judge that you fear if you're on the patentee's side of things because most of her opinions have been coming down anti-patent and I happen to be good friends with Kim's husband, who's a SU engineering alum who I went to engineering school with and also an SU law alum who I went to law school with. Um, and he said she's very, very sensitive to the idea that she's being painted as non anti patent And I said, well, have her raise some opinions where she upholds validity once in a while or finds infringement once in a while and we'll, we'll change our, our tune. Um, but, but like I said, Kim is very, very, very smart. She's a MIT, electrical MIT, master's in electrical engineering. Um, and uh, has a very, very high threshold for what she considers to be patentable subject matter and inventive context. Now, the last bullet point on this slide is in the biotech arena, and I'm not getting into too much detail in the biotech arena, but there's a few cases, Carnegie Mellon versus Hoffman LaRoche, in Ray Alonso, and this Eli Lilly decision that was recently handed down, all of which dealt with this idea of trying to, to get a claim that's broad enough to encompass a genus of a particular uh, compound or combination of compounds, but only disclosing a limited number of species within that genus. And the courts have been coming down saying you cannot have claim coverage as broad to cover the entire uh, genus. You're going to be limited in scope to your species that you describe. So it's, it's very, very literal types of uh, coverage that you're going to be getting in the biotech arena if this precedent continues to hold true. Now, next slide is, is talking a little bit about Bilski. And I put a little picture there of John Paul Stevens, who's a Supreme Court Justice who just turned 89 about a week or two ago, who's never been really pro-patent, um, and kind of wrote the decision that, that ultimately led to this Bilski decision. He's, he's probably very, very much in favor of Bilski. Now, Section 101 of the Patent Statute uh, is the subject matter uh, provision that says whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture or composition of matter or any new and useful improvement thereof uh, may uh, obtain a patent therefore. So it's very, very broad language. Supreme Court precedent said at one point in time that that's so broad that it encompasses anything under the sun made by man in the Chakravarti decision. Uh, but it's been slowly getting sliced away in the context of, of process claims or method claims. Now, Bilski um, which, which was kind of a tough case. It wasn't really a software case per se. And, you know, the, the patent bar in and of ourselves are waiting for a really good software case 
to test the bounds of, of Bilski. Um, but Bilski says the, the test to determine whether a process is patentable subject matter requires an inquiry into whether the process involves the use of a machine or the transformation of matter from one physical state to another physical state. So you either need to transform matter from one thing to another thing, or you need to, to utilize a machine in the exercise of the process. Now, pre-Bilski, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court precedent was such that laws of nature and naturally occurring phenomena and abstract ideas were not considered patentable subject matter outside the reach of Section 101 broad language. Uh, and there has been lots of decisions dealing with, with processes, uh, but, it, but it had been pretty well settled for a long period of time up until uh, Bilski following State Street Bank, which was a, a decision in the late 1990s that held, you know, in essence, business methods that are practiced on a computer to be patentable subject matter because they produce a useful and concrete result, that kind of language. Uh, Kind of created the, the dot com boom, where all of the uh, you know the software companies that were creating applications for running on the World Wide Web, all of a sudden started applying for patents left and right, and all that venture money was pouring into Palo Alto and, and, and Silicon Valley to support these these young programmers to create all these these great tools to be used on the internet. Uh, that all followed on the heels of State Street Bank declaring that kind of thing to be patentable subject matter. Then we get up to, to last year with Bilski, and it's going to take a step back now. It, it's going to be much more difficult for those kinds of applications to be considered uh, patentable subject matter if they're couched in process terms, and typically they are. Now, there, there's going to be certain technical fields that are impacted, and I've listed them there. Now, business methods certainly is one of them, where you're trying to claim a method of, of doing business or a business model, per se. Diagnostic methods are going to become difficult where it's really a, a, you know, a physician or, or some medical person who's running through a particular process uh, to, to uh, come up with some sort of diagnostic uh, uh, conclusion. Data processing where you're really trying to protect protocols um, where there's no uh, transformation of matter and not even necessarily uh, a machine that's implemented for the protocol itself. The protocol is a set of rules that would be implemented by a machine, but a machine itself is not involved in creating the protocol. And uh, those are going to be a little bit more difficult to get through. And then the transformation of data, like compression algorithms or encryption algorithms, uh, will probably be impacted in one way or another uh, by Bilski, because again, you're manipulating the data itself uh, you're not, it's not necessarily the machine that, that ultimately does it, although you certainly could couch claim language uh, in terms of the use of a machine to perform these things, and certainly you're going to need to. There's no question now that, that the uh, inclusion of the machine, whether it's a computer or whether it's an oscilloscope or what, you know, whatever the, the machine is that's being used to effectuate the process, is going to have to find its way into the, into the claims. And bearing that in mind, you got to make sure it's in your specification. So, again, one of the conclusions that comes out of this is make sure the data is transformed or make sure that there's a machine involved in the process and uh, it's advisable that that's all clearly set out in the specification. Now, our only method claims at issue. Um, right now it is. Comiskey is a case that, that's back in the patent office's hands to decide. Um, you know, perhaps, again, uh, Obama and his administration might be of some use here by, by appointing some new Federal Circuit judges when the slots become available, uh, giving more money to some basic research so that we can test the bounds of this a little bit more and take science to the next level. And uh, the next slide, yes? Um, notwithstanding Integra versus Merck, what effect will Bilski ultimately have on the patentability and enforceability of research tool claims in the biotech area? Well, research tool claims um, have, 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 have had a, a little bit more problems since the University of Rochester case. Um, and, and if you're talking about trying to patent the research tool for purposes of capturing its end result, which we would have termed a reach-through claim, uh, 
since the times of the U of R case on its COX-2 inhibitor uh, portfolio, those have not fared well anyway. Um, for research tools where you're claiming the, uh, the, the tool itself for performing the research, uh, if it's a machine, it'll still be patentable subject matter. If it's a process that uses a machine, it still may be uh, patentable. And if the, the research tool itself involves the transformation of matter from one physical state to another, it'll be patentable. But but again, uh, it, it's, it's research tools that have had a little bit more difficulty in their, uh, their, their goals for, for getting broad patent coverage uh, since the time of that U of R case about five years ago. Okay, there's three more Bilski questions. Do you want to move on and then do them at the end? Uh, yeah, I'll move on. I'll try to run through the rest of these slides and then okay. we'll take the, the remaining Bilski questions at the end. Okay. Now, does the machine, um, yeah, does the machine or transformation test make sense? Um, Judge Newman, who is uh, one of the uh, the more expressive uh, justices on the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, unfortunately she, she's, she's getting quite elderly and probably won't be there for too much longer, but she's our, uh, you know, the current court's Judge Rich, and Judge Rich was the guy that wrote the, the 1952 Patent Act and was a CAFC judge and, and really took issue with a lot of the uh, uh, Parker v. Fluke and Supreme Court precedent that, that kind of carved out patentable subject matter. Uh, Newman is the one judge that you can always rely on for a pro-patent position. And um, she doesn't see the machine or transformation test as making much sense. If, if you're getting decisions that are offered in the majority by Judge Newman, uh, she may swing the pendulum back in favor of a broader reading of Section 101. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it remains to be seen because there's not too many pro-patent judges on the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit right now. In Ray Ferguson is a case I don't want to get into. It's just a very, it's a really a very silly case. It's a marketing method that was prosecuted by the inventors, and then the, the, the litigation was done by the inventors, and it made absolutely no sense. Um, but the decision that came out of it uh, arguably overruled State Street, arguably overruled Freeman Walter Avalee, and some other technological arts tests that, that were in there. Uh, but the, uh, the opinion wasn't terribly clear on, on those particular points. Now, cynical view of the current trends, it's really a one-two punch in view of these 101, 103, and 112 decisions. Punch one, what is happening under the subject matter statute makes it harder to claim functionally, that is to say broader. An evolving 101 law is pushing us to claim in terms of hardware specifications and what we actually disclose, which is purely incompatible with broad coverage. And then we have evolving 112 law that's saying, uh, the broad claims better be in the spec as filed, and even if they are, they might still be invalid for lack of commensurate enablement, which is the strict case, or written description problems, which is the lizard tech case. So broad claims are becoming difficult to defend. And then you get punch two, which is this 103 law. And 103 law is saying that the nuts and bolts type limitations are obvious because the proverbial nuts and bolts are always known in a given art, and it's obvious to make these new combinations of known elements at least in the predictable arts. So narrow claims in the predictable arts are becoming difficult at best, at least where the claim is narrow to avoid some prior art in the general uh, view. And then if we look at the conclusions to draw from those that one-two punch of my cynical view of the current trends, narrow claims can be obtained in the unpredictable arts. You can't get broad claims because of that genus species type problem in the biotech area and the 112 issues so you're, you're dealing with the written description issues. The broad inventions in the predictable arts are going to pass 103, but they're only going to cover, be covered by a set of claims that are much narrower than the broadest scope of the invention, so you can pass sections 101 and 112. So in the predictable arts, you can only have coverage in cases where you can be sure your claim is trivially easy to design around with embodiments that still have the advantage of your invention disclosure, uh, which again, in my academic view, is, is, is a sarcastically a great public policy of encouraging innovation, and that's, that's the way I see the, the court's decisions over the last year coming out. Um, they're, they're swinging the pendulum too far in one direction, and it's possibly spurred by the number of what we call troll lawsuits, which are those non-manufacturing entities that are simply licensing portfolios of patents and, and using them as swords and uh, raising the cost of patent litigation through the roof. Quickly on uh, patent licensing, Quanta versus LG Electronics Supreme Court case last year, if a license 
authorizes a sale, the patent is going to be considered exhausted in the downstream direction. So if you license it to the manufacturer of the semiconductor product, the retailers and the manufacturers of the consumer products that purchase that particular chip embedded in the consumer product sell it to the retailer, the retailer sells it to the end user, end user uses it, all of those downstream parties are safe from infringement because the patent right will have said to have been exhausted uh, in that particular direction. Now this involved a semiconductor case where Intel was the licensee and there was no language in the license regarding what uh, Intel could do. So what it did, it sold the chips that it manufactured under license to uh, a company who put it into a consumer product. They then got, that consumer product company got sued for infringement and argued, you can't sue us, we bought it from Intel, Intel was licensed and your rights were exhausted and, and ultimately they won. Now there was some, some precedent that, that made that questionable prior to uh, Quanta versus LG and that's why the Supreme Court took it up and it was an important issue. Since then, we've had a couple of cases, uh, patent exhaustion at the CAFC, Excel Store Technology, patent exhaustion prohibits patentees from enforcing the patent rights in certain circumstances, but does not forbid multiple licenses on a single product or even multiple royalties, so that gives some hope to getting multiple rights. Transcore versus Electronic Transaction Consultants, decision about a month ago, which was a covenant not to sue, not a license, but they considered it as a license. And there were not all the patents included in the covenant, but the unlicensed patents or the patents on which there was no covenant were required to practice those patents that there was a covenant not to sue on. And the court said, your rights are therefore exhausted because they're required to practice that which they have the right to practice. A couple of strategy tips on avoiding exhaustion. Use multiple patents, so you might want to apply for patents at different points in the distribution chain so that you can then license it to the different points in the distribution chain. Uh, open question as to when uh, patent rights are, are required from each other. Substantial non-infringing use analysis may be the tool lawyers ultimately use to, to do that. And then contracting around, you can't get rid of exhaustion by saying exhaustion does not apply necessarily. Uh, but you probably can get rid of exhaustion by saying that sales to or from an unlicensed party are not licensed. They're unauthorized sales. Uh, dangerous game, don't try to shield your licensee while reserving the right to go after the licensee's customers and suppliers. Make sure the intent of your license is clear in your recitals to the license agreement. And um, I want to conclude with that. I would have spent a little bit more time, but I wanted to get through and answer some of the questions that have, that have come up. So I'll take uh, the questions now. Okay. Um, wouldn't Bilski throw out all disease biomarkers? Are biomarkers any less important or complex than machines that produce rubber molds? No, they're not any less important. And again, if you're, if you're trying to protect, protect the biomarker, you perhaps have to tie it to the machine uh, that makes the biomarker ultimately useful at the end of the day. So again, uh, bring a machine into play in the claim language so that the, so that the uh, technology can be protected. As applied to business methods, can bills be reduced to two tests? Um, first, are there actual algorithms that implement the business method? And two, can these algorithms possibly be executed without the use of a computer? The, um, the patent office is taking a very, very broad view and, and probably too broad a view of the effects of Bilski in that regard. Um, but it does seem to be coming down in, in certain instances to form over substance uh, where you have an algorithm that may be practicable without the use of a machine if you claim it uh, in combination with the machine. Um, you know, I've been able to get patents through in that way. Uh, so the patent office has been receptive to those arguments that you're actually using a machine where a machine can be used. Uh, but certainly you're foregoing uh, scope uh, with respect to, to the practice of the method without a machine. So um, it, it absolutely has an effect, but right now it seems to be more form over substance in terms of, of this machine or transformation test. Okay. Um, that's it. Um, maybe if there's any other questions, okay. we'll catch it. If there are any other questions, um, email them in. 
And uh, also, I will give you my personal email address if, if you want to email me. My email address is G McGuire, M C G U I R E, at BSK.com. And I'm happy to uh, correspond with you via email or if you give me a call, 315 218 8515. Uh, I'm glad to speak with you regarding any questions you might have uh, regarding the presentation or, or other issues. Thank you very much.